Okay, thank you very much uh, for uh, everyone who attends uh, the, the, the call today. So the title of the talk is Advances in CRISPR Screens, Gene Modulation and Single Cell Analysis Provide New Insight. So let's get going. Before I begin, I just have to read this out. So the life science business of Merck KGAA Darmstadt, Germany operates as Millipore Sigma in the US and Canada, but elsewhere we are known as Merck. Screening strategies have really evolved over the past couple of decades from swinging blindly in the dark with random mutagenesis, growing into more educated approaches in the age of genome sequencing with ORFs and RNAi libraries, until we arrive in this golden era of CRISPR where we have high precision, high efficiency targeting for controlled manipulation of the genome. Now, when it comes to our place in genome editing technology or our history, we really are leading the way in the genome editing field. And we did not come into the field in the CRISPR era. We started over 15 years ago with Targetron, which was a prokaryotic system. And then through a licensing agreement with Sangamo Biosciences, we were the first commercial company to offer a targeted genome engineering tool known as zinc finger nucleases uh, back in 2007. Along the way, we've also had a number of firsts with our scientists collaborating uh, with Sangamo um, to generate ZFN gene knockout rats. And also we were the first to show that oligos could be used as a donor template for integration. Then we move on to the CRISPR era. And once again, not only were we the first to market with CRISPR-based products, but we filed our first patent very early on in 2012. Now, we already have a very strong relationship with the Broad Institute, but we have continued to work through collaborations with innovative and world-renowned institutes and companies to bring groundbreaking tools to our customers with the examples here being the first to market Sanger Whole Genome Array Lentivirus Human and Mouse Libraries in collaboration with the Wellcome Trust Sanger Institute in the UK, the 10X Genomics Compatible Custom Pools for Single Cell Analysis via collaboration with 10X Genomics, and then earlier this year, the whole genome CRISPR-I libraries in collaboration with UCSF. In addition, we've also continued to invest heavily in our own R&D, and some of you may have heard a talk given by my colleague Jennifer Bennett earlier this week, oh, actually last week, on our new Pure Edit RNP reagents for translational research that will be coming out early next year. I mentioned uh, IP. Uh, we also maintain a very strong footprint in the CRISPR IP landscape, with several more patents recently awarded, taking us to 40 at present, with no doubt more to come. And these are covering a number of different technologies, CRISPR integration, and then a couple of technologies where we're trying to access parts of the genome which are uh, have been previously inaccessible with CRISPR Chrome and Proxy CRISPR. Um, prepared Nick Age is more of a, a, um, a specificity technology, and then we have normal, novel uh, gene modification systems as well. So now let's move to the crux of the presentation, which is screening using CRISPR. Now there are primary, primarily two types of screens that you can do. Pool screens, which combine thousands of shRNA or guide RNAs in a single tube, and arrayed screens, which consist of thousands of unique wells of individual shRNA or guide RNAs. Pool screens are most widely used and pretty straightforward up front, but require much more of a time investment on the back end due to data deconvolution and validation, because obviously you have these guides in a pool. Arrayed screens require a more substantial upfront investment of labor, because obviously you've got one gene, uh, sorry, one guide per well, which means you've got multiple uh, plates there. But they do yield a broader diversity of data points and much less back end effort, because as you know which guide is in each well, the data is already collected. But the general workflow for these two types of CRISPR screens is pretty much the same. Okay. So with that in mind, we have libraries suitable for both options, as you can see here. So we have arrayed and pooled options across all the main technologies, being CRISPR knockout, CRISPR A, and CRISPR I. As I said, we also have shRNA as well as OFFs, but that's not the purpose of the call. Uh, the, sorry, the, the presentation today. And these libraries allow customers to start at the top of the funnel, as you can see on the right, with genome-wide libraries to interrogate the whole genome. Moving on to off the shelf or customized to your needs subpools, 
for narrowing down the hits, and finally individual clones for validation, which again can be either off the shelf or customized to whatever specification you require. I will call out here that we've launched an expanded list of knockout CRISPR-I and CRISPR-A pooled libraries uh, to what we've traditionally offered in the last week, actually. Um, and I will highlight uh, these as we go through the presentation. Okay, so CRISPR as a genome engineering tool can be used to achieve a wide array of genetic modifications. Gene knockout is probably the most common option shown here, but today we're going to focus in more detail on epigenetic regulation using CRISPR activation and inhibition while still touching on CRISPR knockout. Really, the take-home message here is that we can harness the power of CRISPR technology to enable virtually any genomic manipulation desired. When people talk about uses of CRISPR and CRISPR-mediated gene editing, they're usually talking about nuclease-based creation of double-stranded breaks. When using nuclease-based CRISPR technologies, we're really relying on the endogenous DNA repair mechanisms to achieve the desired modification. The outcomes are achieved through either NHEJ or HDR. But, and although there are some tools and strategies that can shift this balance a little, it's not really your choice which mechanism the cell uses to repair the double-stranded break. And it predominantly uses NHEJ, often resulting in a loss of function mutation caused by a frame-shifting insertion or deletion. However, the full extent of CRISPR's utility extends beyond just targeted cutting of DNA. Nuclease-independent applications of CRISPR provide all of the targeting specificity, but for cargo delivery, the most use of which is for gene regulation. So let's start with CRISPR knockout before we delve into gene regulation. In terms of arrayed screening, Merck partnered with the Wellcome Trust Sanger Institute to develop the highest quality arrayed CRISPR screening format. This library spans the whole genome of human and mouse, so that would be targeting more than 17,000 and more than 20,000 genes respectively. The library and individual clones are pre-made and are available off the shelf so you can get what you need as soon as you need it. There are two guide RNAs per gene available where the team focused on minimizing redundancy and focused on the best guide RNAs rather than more guide RNAs. It's available in glycerol stock or in lentiviral format, and if you go for the individual clones, these are also available in DNA format. You have the option of the whole genome, your own favorite set of genes, or choosing from one of our multiple focus panels, and more on that on the next slide. The guide RNA vector contains both pure selection marker as well as a blue fluorescent protein or, or BFP, as highlighted in the image on the right. In terms of the guide RNA design, we use specially designed bioinformatic algorithms to maximize gene knockout by targeting the first half of the protein coding sequence of the gene, but obviously avoiding the first 90 base pairs of coding sequence where alternative start sites are known to occur. We also strive to optimize targeting by avoiding SNPs and only accepting guide RNA designs that have at least two base pair mismatch at other genomic sites. There is a joint paper that was written by researchers at the Sanger and at Sigma Aldrich, which used the Sanger library and is referenced here. Functional knockout was demonstrated in Cas9 expressing AML cells by stably integrating guided RNAs against seven GPI genes before treatment with a fluorescently labeled erylicin toxin in a so-called flare assay. Now, loss of function of the GPI genes results in loss of GPI-anchored cell surface proteins. And since flare binds into cells expressing the GPI anchor proteins, loss of the protein should mean a loss of flare activity, which can then be detected by flow. As you can see on the right, in two separate AML cells, sorry, two, two different AML cell lines with two different guides per gene, as you can see in red and green, the percentage of flare negative cells demonstrates that the Sanger guide RNAs were able to generate significant functional knockout. Now, I've already mentioned uh, to start off with that you can choose either whole uh, library, whole genome library, or from one of our multiple curated evidence-based focus panels. So now we spent 
some time looking at the genes that make our panels in a number of different available databases, and then we made two versions of our panels. The expanded discovery is much larger and contains genes that, that appear in at least one of the databases, whereas the core essential is more focused, requiring the genes to be in two or more databases. And of course, we can increase stringency even further for custom panels that you may want. That was the array screen. On the pool screen side, we have a number of options for you. Now, traditionally, we have offered the option of the Gecko version 2 and a Sigma pool, which is an extension of the Gecko version 2 with more guides and separated into eight pools rather than two. We now, in the last week, have expanded to include new off-the-shelf pooled offerings that include novel and state-of-the-art algorithms for guide RNA selection and efficiency from the primary literature. And of course, as I've already mentioned, we can uh, also make custom versions of all of our libraries using any of the available vectors from these whole genomes. I have on here deconvolution, but I will speak about our deconvolution service in a later, yeah, sorry, later in the talk. Okay, so now let's move to the nucleus independent applications of CRISPR. These applications use a nuclease dead version of Cas9 called DCAS9, which harbors point mutations that inactivate only the DNA cleavage function. CRISPR can be used to activate or inhibit transcription by delivering effector domains to attract or repel the transcriptional machinery. While CRISPR-A technology has evolved over time into more creative and powerful activators, CRISPR-I has remained relatively unchanged due to its high inhibitory efficiency. So let's um, let's begin with uh, with uh, with with uh, with the strategy, the targeting strategy. So when it comes to targeting strategy and guide design, CRISPR-A and CRISPR-I are comparatively much simpler than CRISPR cutting. When you design a guide for knockout, you require gene-specific design, right? Targeted exons must be shared between all isoforms to avoid potential compensation. The target site must be early enough in the gene to ensure complete loss of function, as I mentioned before, because you don't want to be so early that you may allow usage of an alternative or cryptic start codon. Activation and inhibition, on the other hand, have universal design rules. Targeting bases surrounding the transcriptional start site, meaning one guide, can capture all splice variants from a single TSS. Because of this specificity, you can have high confidence in guides. And with these systems, you can worry much less as a result about off-target activity due to nuclease independence and tight activity windows. Let's start with CRISPR activation then. The Synergistic Activation Mediator, or SAM, was created by Feng Zhang's lab at the Broad Institute and is a powerful three-part CRISPR-based transcriptional activator complex. At its core is the DCAS9 VP64 fusion protein that forms the basic synthetic transcriptional factor. It complexes with a guide RNA which has been modified to include two RNA aptamers, and then these aptamers recruit additional transcriptional co-activators via binding of a fused MS2 viral code protein. The final complex is capable of driving robust activation of gene expression at the target locus. Now, although a number of CRISPR activators exist, including a different one of their own, George Church's lab published a nice comparison paper showing that the CRISPR-SAM system is the superior activator. This result was then validated in IPSCs by the Metacopian Lab at the Wellcome Trust Sanger Institute. And therefore, this is the CRISPR-A technology that we chose to develop and offer. As I mentioned before, CRISPR-SAM is an effective transcriptional activator. This QRT-PCR amplification curve shows that guides to OCT4 increase expression above baseline by 9 to 10 cycles, which I'm sure you'll agree is a lot. Because CRISPR-SAM drives activation uh, of gene expression from endogenous loci, the level of activation will be dependent on the baseline activity of the locus. For example, hex cells are differentiated and express OCT4 at low level, so you can see a strong increase with CRISPR-SAM, uh, 
Whereas in iPSCs, on the other hand, activation of OCT4 would not appear significant because that locus is already fully active and OCT4 is already highly transcribed. In this graph, you can see ACE2 expression activation in hex cells. These numbers might seem unrealistically high because ACE2 is just not expressed in these cells. So a big delta delta CT will give very high fold change numbers. It also shows that although some genes can benefit from combinatorial effects of multiple guides, not all genes show or need these cumulative effects. And this system is also highly effective in other eukaryotic and mammalian systems like mice, seen here via the Neuro2G activation. Now, although CRISPR-Sam activation is effective in plasmid form for transient transfections, the original backbone produces poorly packaged lentiviral particles. On the left is a P24 ELISA count showing total viral particles and packaged functional viruses on the right. And you can see it's many orders of magnitude lower, which is obviously bad. So we modified the vector backbone to improve viral production, and we also optimized the system for improved transcriptional efficiency, including putting a G in the final, sorry, in the first position of the guide RNA that was missing in the original design. Our modified lentiplasmids produce substantially higher levels of functional virus. Without this improvement, for this sample here to transduce 100,000 cells in a 12-well plate, for example, you'd have to add 40 mil of mostly empty virus per well to get appropriate transduction. With our lenti particles at this titer, with our modifications, you'd only need about 10 microliters of virus, so down from 40 mil to 10 microliters. Our functional type of SAM now meets the efficiency we believe is required for whole genome scre screening with a pool's library of guides. So why would you add CRISPR-A or CRISPR-A screening to your toolbox? CRISPR-A is complementary to existing loss of function technologies as each enriches for different sets of genes responsible for the same phenotypes. However, unlike loss of function technologies, CRISPR-A is fairly unique for gain of function screening. To achieve a loss of function with a CRISPR nuclease, the Cas9 needs to create a double-stranded break that happens to be repaired in such a way that an indel either causes a frame shift or disrupts a functional domain in every copy of the gene, as we've discussed. When performing a knockout screen in cancer cell line, you often have to worry about the ability to completely knock out high copy number genes due to polyploidy. They, these aren't concerns for activation screens because only one copy of the target gene is needed. The targeting complex just needs to bind to one copy and recruit the co-activators. With DCAS9-based systems, there's also no risk of genome instability from double-stranded breaks because, unlike nuclei, there is no cutting. And by activating transcription at the endogenous locus, instead of, the trans, instead of transgenic overexpression of a defined ice form, CRISPR-A allows the cell to dictate isoform expression and splice variation in a more physiologically relevant manner in contrast to transgenic overexpression screens with, say, ORFs. So we currently offer custom pools and off-the-shelf whole genome lentiviral libraries for human and mouse in this system uh, as part of our CRISPR-SAM offering. Now, to validate our libraries, we performed a BRAF inhibitor screen, also described in Feng Zhang's original SAM paper. We transduced CRISPR-SAM stable A375 BRAF mutant melanoma cells with one of our SAM guide library subpools, and we selected with PLX4720 or Vemurafenib to enrich for cells that were resistant to drug-mediated growth inhibition. Our screen produced EGFR as a top hit, which recapitulates the data showing EGFR as a driver of resistance to this drug. To ensure that CRISPR-A is functioning normally in your cell line, we recommend using our RFX4 positive control. RFX4 expression is generally not detected in most cell lines reported and is amenable to strong activation with CRISPR-SAM. This particular guide target is conserved across human, mouse, and rat, and is a suitable positive control for cell lines derived from each of them. Now, I mentioned earlier that we have some new pool libraries, but we didn't just stop at those new pool libraries for knockout that I mentioned before. These two activation libraries 
for both mouse and human represent the next set of evolved CRISPR activation libraries using data-driven discovery to optimize guide RNA placement and selection to deliver highly efficient, compact libraries for maximum results in your screening experiments. Again, this is from the primary literature, and I do have a slide at the end mentioning the publications. So while gain-of-function CRISPR screening is obvious in its complementary relationship to traditional CRISPR knockout screening, CRISPR-I actually offers unique complementarity to both systems. CRISPR interference mediates the inhibition of gene expression by competing with the transcriptional machinery for promoter binding, thus inhibiting transcription initiation. Additionally, the CRAB or cruple associated box effector domain recruits epigenetic modifier proteins to further repress local transcription. As part of our continuing efforts to bring you the best tools available, we now offer the improved CRISPR-I guide design and guide scaffold through an agreement with UCSF. And we also recently partnered with 10X Genomics to develop compatible CRISPR products to enhance your screening capabilities. Now, CRISPR-I technology has been described in great detail by the labs of Luke Gilbert at UCSF and Jonathan Wiseman, who is now at MIT. This figure shows the optimal targeting window for CRISPR-I here in orange. Much like CRISPR-A, it operates within a fairly specific targeting window surrounding the transcriptional start site. Now, their guide design strategy for CRISPR-I has been updated over the years and it has improved substantially based on optimized guide algorithms and machine learning, and most recently incorporates nucleosome positioning data to improve genomic accessibility. Here they show how the predicted guide activity has improved with each iteration of guide design optimization, and the arrow shows you that we are using the CRISPR-I version 2.1 in our libraries. Now we compare the top guides between this and a competitor algorithm to determine which guide design yields the best knockdown, and we focused on targets identified as hard to repress. Show our guide design algorithm results in optimum knockdown. But the Wiseman lab didn't stop there. So they also conducted a series of guide RNA sequence modifications to improve transcription and guide stability. They identified a putative RNA polymerase three termination signal in the guide and found that CRISPR transcription could be enhanced by flipping two ANU nucleotides to prevent early termination. On top of that, they additionally found that by extending the length of the stem loop, guide stability was enhanced within the cells. And interestingly, there's actually a cumulative effect of these two improvements, and that results in peak CRISPR efficiency. So once again, we wanted to perform our own evaluation of the improved guide RNA scaffold using genes that we found to be easy to knock down in several of our cell lines, so HEY1 and HES1 on the right, and genes described to be difficult to efficiently inhibit, like calnexin on the left. Our results clearly show that the improved guide RNA enhances CRISPR knockdown efficiency for nearly every guide that we've tested. As I mentioned before, CRISPR-I technology has remained relatively unchanged since its development in 2013, but a recent paper in Nature Methods described a targeted approach to find new CRISPR repressors. They identified MECP2, which is a chromatin-modifying gene involved in Rett syndrome, and they fused its transcriptional repressor domain to DCAS9 CRAB. Now, although MECP2 is thought to perform other cellular functions, the authors reported that it enhanced CRISPR-I for hard-to-repress target genes. Now, we performed a trans sorry, we, com we performed a comprehensive comparison of all combinations of the guide modifications, designs and these competing effectors. However, our evaluation did not identify any instances for dozens of targets where the MECP2 construct was superior over crab cas 9 especially when combined with the improved guide RNA scaffold and our guide design already mentioned. An additional uh, improvement, we used a DCAS9 with an N-terminal crab fusion that further improves knockdown efficiency. And we also incorporated a UCOE element in the promoter to stabilize expression. For all of these reasons, we developed our CRISPR-I system and libraries based on crab DCAS9 and the improved guide design and scaffold described by the labs at UCSF. 
And because of this, we remain confident that our combination of CRISPR-I components is really the best knockdown system commercially available. To ensure that CRISPR-I is functioning normally in your cell line, we recommend using our Lenti GRAB1A positive control. GRAB1A has a fairly uniform expression reported across cell lines from different tissue types, as you can see from the uh, protein atlas expression at the top, uh, as well as um, resulting in efficient knockdown, as you can see on the bottom when we use CRISPR-I. So why should you add CRISPR-I and CRISPR-I screening to your toolbox? So CRISPR-I is complementary to existing gain of function and loss of function technologies. Obviously, the most comparison would be with RNAi. Unlike RNAi, CRISPR-I does not compete for any endogenous cellular machinery. By inhibiting gene function at the level of transcription using CRISPR-I, we can observe increased knockdown efficiency over RNAi, which has to keep disrupting the translation of continuously, dis continuously transcribed mRNA. They'll both achieve the same goal, and each can reveal novel information, but one of them is molecularly more efficient, which is the CRISPR-I. We can now also target non-coding RNAs for inhibition with more reliable loss of function than possible with CRISPR nucleases. And unlike CRISPR nucleases, which need to cut the DNA and create function-breaking indels, CRISPR-I can increase the odds of disrupting gene expression by only requiring binding of the complex to each copy of the locus. And most importantly, although CRISPR-I can yield up to 99% knockdown efficiency, because it's still incomplete loss of function, you can still reveal essential genes that would otherwise be overlooked in a knockout screen. Why should you use Sigma Aldrich CRISPR I reagents? Well, DCAS9 fused to CRAB effector domain mediates efficient knockdown. And although only a couple of alternative effectors have been described, CRAB based CRISPR I continues to be a well published technology for single targets and pool screening. Here are just a handful of great papers that relied on this technology. And don't forget, we've actually moved the CRAB to the end terminal, <clears throat> and that seems to work even better along with the UCOE element that we added. So why should you, sorry, um, I've gone back on one second, sorry, there we go. So we just recently launched our whole genome CRISPR-I libraries in March, uh, but for those of you who want to explore more focused corners of the genome, this is broken into individually available sub-libraries that are categorized into functional groupings like the drug pool genome and non-coding genes. So you have both options. And of course, we can customize. Now, these are highly functional guide libraries. We use them to perform an enrichment screen to implicate genes and pathways responsible for resistance to drug-mediated cell death in human lung adenocarcinoma cells using paclitaxel and established chemotherapeutic. Sorry. Cells stably expressing CRAB DCAS9 were transduced with lentiguide RNAs from the cancer and apoptosis subpool. And while our analysis using magic flute identified anticipated genes like TP53, we also identified a novel role for NF2 or Merlin in PAX-mediated cell death. So this data shows the utility of CRISPR-I screening to identify new genes and pathways involved in drug and disease phenotypes. Once again, we've rounded out our new pool libraries to include these two new inhibition libraries. The Dolcetto library is compact and efficient, allowing for more replicates or screening without requiring more cells or NGS for analysis. And then the CRISPR-I10X CRISPR compatible library is derived from druggable genome pool from the 2016 paper published by the Wiseman Lab. The 10X compatibility stems from our partnership with and collaboration with 10X Genomics R&D team, showing that our lentiviral vectors are highly compatible with their feature barcode technology. Okay, now although I introduced CRISPR-A and CRISPR-I as standalone technologies for screening, their complementarity allows for enrichment of different gene sets for the same phenotypes and for orthogonal validation of important pathways. This is really a beautiful screen, and it was performed by Luke Gilbert and colleagues to explore the gene pathways that govern the sensitizing and protective responses to a cholera diphtheria toxin fusion. They capitalize on this orthogonal validation strategy of pairing CRISPR-I and CRISPR-A in parallel. 
They highlight the significance of specific biosynthetic pathways that modulate the sensitivity to this toxin. Here you see GM1A, which functions as a receptor for this toxin. Knocking out the enzyme that makes this gangliocide has a non-protective effect on cells. Using crispr i pool screening, knockdown of enzymes in this biosynthetic pathway recapitulates this protective effect. Using CRISPR-A as a complementary screening approach revealed additional biosynthetic pathways that confer this protection. This results, these, sorry, these results highlight the capacity of CRISPR-A to complement CRISPR-I by probing the consequences of upregulating pathways that might otherwise be inactive and therefore missed by loss of function screening. The complementary phenotypes observed for the same target screened using CRISPR-I and CRISPR-A illustrates the strength of pairing these two screening technologies and highlights the value of orthogonal validation using both. One thing that's common about all of the screens that I've talked about today is the use of lentivirus as a delivery platform for each of the CRISPR components. So why would you use lentivirus, or why should you use lentivirus when conducting CRISPR screens? They're highly efficient at delivering small to large genetic payloads. They're capable of infecting dividing and non-dividing cells. They bypass the need to correctly mix and pre-complex delivery agents, like if you're using RNP. And most importantly, they allow stable expression of CRISPR components throughout the length of your experiment. Now, I did say I'd come back to this. With pooled screening, an important component of the workflow is deconvolution. So you can actually get a readout of your hits. We can accept cell pellets after the screen has been performed, or if you'd rather do the DNA extraction yourself, we can accept DNA pellets. Once we QC the DNA, we perform deep sequencing of the samples and provide you with easy to analyze data showing each gene target and the counts associated with those targets. The nice thing about this is that we can bundle in the deconvolution at the time of purchase of the pools, which leaves the package as being a highly cost-effective end-to-end solution for a pooled screening project. So we can do the deconvolution for you. Finally, we've been talking about using these large format screens to narrow down a list of relevant gene candidates. But to take a deeper functional genomics dive, we can now combine CRISPR screening with single cell analysis. So we've partnered with 10X Genomics to develop compatible reagents for CRISPR and CRISPR-I that allow for individual targets or custom pools to explore the transcriptional changes in single cells for a more in-depth molecular analysis. Our 10X compatible vectors contain one of four different 10X feature barcoding capture motifs, which you can see here on the left to facilitate guide identification in each cell. You can see that we have capture sequence one and capture sequence two, and then we have two versions of each. So one where the uh, capture sequence is, uh, sorry, the, the, the barcode is on the, um, on the stem loop or on the three prime end. And then on the right, you can see knockdown efficiency across the different capture sequences for our recommended CRISPR-I positive control guides by qPCR. And you can see a uh, very nice knockdown. Because we've observed differences in capture sequence for each capture sequence between different cell lines, we have created an optimization kit with controls containing each of these capture sequences, and that should allow you to determine which is the best capture strategy for your cell line and experiments. So using the loop cell browser in Cell Ranger from 10X, we can visualize each cell represented by a single dot in one of these experiments. On the left is a UMAP projection of gene expression-based clustering. And on the right, cells are clustered based on guide identity and are clearly distinguishable. Using those colors and looking back to the plot on the left, we can see that there are no major clustering differences between our RAP1A control guide versus the non-targeting guide based on global expression profiles. Analyzing target gene expression based on guide identity, we can see a significant reduction of RAB1A mRNA in cells that receive the RAB1A CRISPR-I guide versus the non-targeting guide. 
this work was done in collaboration with uh, R&D over at 10X Genomics. We also needed to make sure that no combination of capture sequence and location disrupts global transcriptional profiling in cells. So cells containing guides with each of the four capture motifs separately can be completely overlaid and do not segregate independently, as you can see here. Measuring guide efficiency, RAB1A expression across all guide formats shows similar and significant knockdown. We also made sure that no combination of capture sequence and location disrupts. I just talked about that one second, sorry, there we go. We then tested our compatible vectors in a pooled format of about 100 guides. On the left, we can see clustering based on global gene expression profiling. On the right, we can see distinct clustering based on CRISPR guide identification, showing that this platform is capable of identifying unique guides in a pool and allows exploration of gene expression in a single cell as a consequence of a specific CRISPR guide. Let's focus in on cells containing one of those CRISPR eye guides targeting ELOF1 versus the non-targeting control guide. We can see significant knockdown of ELOF1 that correlates with guide identity. And if we look at global transcriptional changes between these two populations of cells, we can highlight those genes that are down-regulated down in the experimental cells and those that are up-regulated relative to cells with a non-targeting control guide. Single cell analysis with our 10X compatible CRISPR vectors, therefore, is a great way to probe the functional consequences of target gene modulation with CRISPR and presents an ideal opportunity to, to follow up on top hits from a pooled CRISPR screen with a single cell RNA-seq using small pools of guides. To finish off, I have mentioned several times the new pooled library was launched, and they, have all, they are all libraries that have been published. So here is a slide showing the publications that they come from. With that, I would like to thank you very much for your time, and I will take any questions, but I will leave it on the previous slide so you can uh, have a look at those publications again. Thank you, Gupreet, for your informative presentation. We will now start the Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen. Let's get started. Our first question is, do you have bench protocols for screening with each of these platforms? Yeah, uh, we do. We have extensive protocols on our website. Uh, they're easy enough to find. Um, and of course, if there's anything that you have additional questions on, you can always contact us and we have, uh, we have um, uh, extensive knowledge in the, in the company to help you. Thank you for that. Our next question is, can CRISPR-A and CRISPR-I be used in the same cells at the same time? Um, so at the moment, I would say with the existing technology and the fact that you have different Cas9s um, or Cas9s with, with modifications on them to do CRISPR-A and CRISPR-I, I think the technology with the existing technology, that's, that's not going to be efficient. Uh, so I would say at the moment, uh, no. You'd have to do them side by side, but you can't do them at the same time in the same cells. Okay. And then for we have another really good question coming in. Can these screens be done in primary cells or only in immortalized lines? Uh, so we we've done we've done a lot of work in immortalized lines, um, but I know there are publications out there, especially from uh, I think Alex Marson, uh, using primary cells. I believe it can be done. Um, there are additional considerations to take into account. You know, some cells may be resistant to uh, to some of the technologies like CRISPR or CRISPR A, um, but no, you should be able to uh, to 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 use both types of cells. Thank you for that. So our next question, can these libraries be edited or modified? Mm. So um, if you buy the off-the-shelf versions of this, then no. But you know, as, as I went through the presentation several times, I mentioned custom. Um, so we can pretty much customize anything. So if you wanted your own guides, 
um, in any of the vectors that we already have, or even if you have um, some vectors of your own, we, we can actually do that. There's a little bit more work to be done there. We have to do that. We can, um, we can pretty much customize anything, but if you bought one of the off-the-shelf um, uh, lines, one of the off-the-shelf libraries, then no, those can't be edited or modified. And we do sell the final product, right? So we um, already um, do the cloning in for you, and, and when, what we provide is, is, is ready to use, so you can't take one that we already have and then modify it yourself. Okay, thank you for that. It looks like we have time for one more question. Do we have products for CRISPR I or a to generate AAV or in vivo research in mice? So I, I'm I'm not sure. I, so yes, we do ha obviously have products for CRISPR I, uh, but they're all in lentivirus. We don't have any um, any um, AAV based CRISPR I products but if there is if there is an interest there's always things that we're willing to discuss uh, but no we don't have anything off the shelf or anything that we've done recently to my knowledge I do have one of the product managers um, on here with me maybe he can he can add in but as far as I know um, we haven't done any AAV work um, but yes all of our CRISPR I reagents are in lentivirus yeah, th this is Casey. Um, I'm one of the uh, genome editing and modulation uh, product managers. Um, we, we don't currently offer anything in AAV. As you know, um, CRISPR-I um, with all the, 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 the size is, is, is rate limiting in terms of these products. Um, but certainly we can um, discuss on a custom basis as, as G uh, mentioned earlier, uh, we can certainly do this on, and, and discuss on a custom basis. All right. Thank you, Casey and Gapreet. Do you have any final comments for our audience? Uh, no. I mean, I, so we've we've obviously recently expanded the um, the libraries that we have. There's obviously other products that we haven't talked about today. Our, our portfolio is, is is very broad. Uh, we have RNPs. Um, uh, obviously, today we didn't talk about the SHRNA or the OFS, but there are other products. And then in terms of our CRISPR portfolio, we've just enhanced that with the new pooled libraries that uh, that we um, that we've launched. We've already had a lot of interest in those. Um, so anybody who is interested in any of those uh, types of reagents, whether it's pools, whether it's arrayed, whether it's individual um, different formats of, of guide RNAs or shRNA or OFs, please do get in touch with us. Uh, as I said at the start, we have a, a long history in this area and an unparalleled expertise. So don't be afraid to, to contact us for any questions uh, that do come up afterwards. And thank you for listening. Thank you again, Capreet, for your time today and your important research. Before we go, I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today for, and for all of their interesting questions. I'd also like to thank our sponsor, Millipore Sigma, for sponsoring today's webinar. Questions we did not have time for today and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by the speaker via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. This webcast can be viewed on demand for two years until September 29th of 2023. Labyrinth will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. And until next time, goodbye. <laughs>